Good evening, everyone. This is Pastor Mike with our Addictions Bible Study. Uh, to give you a little background for those of you who don't know, we have um, a few people in our church that uh, have dealt with various addictions. We call them, um, the Bible calls it sin, and so we don't shy away from that. Uh, but we've had um, several people with that have dealt with in their past alcohol, drugs like, well, marijuana, methamphetamine, cocaine, um, I'm not sure any heroin, but you know, it could be. Um, and then myself, back in 2016, I um, talked about this uh, several months ago, back in 2016. Uh, I was having some really bad pain issues, went to see a pain management doctor, and um, he immediately put me on Percocet. And that was the wrong thing, um, especially with what I learned about the use of opiate pain medicine. Now I can understand someone who's had surgery or uh, uh, some sort of you know, traumatic injury and in help as the body heals. But just to be put on an opiate as a common everyday thing, from what I learned after I started getting help with that, a, a terrible idea. And there's lawsuits now all over the country because doctors were doing this and primarily because the drug manufacturers were giving kickbacks to the doctors as they prescribed all these opiates. And what I found out was that the opiates cover the brain recept the pain receptors in your brain. Well, the pain receptors are there for a reason and the brain says we're not feeling any pain. So it builds new pain receptors. Then you find out that what you were taking for that pain isn't good enough. You have to take more. Then your brain builds more pain receptors and then you have to take more. And it didn't take very long until all of a sudden one pill turned into two, which turned into three, which turned into five. And I'm not making this up just in order to keep the pain down to a manageable level, I was up to 10, 10 milligram Percocets at a time. That's, and when you run out of those um, and you start going into withdrawals, it, the, the pain is so intense, you just don't want to live. And, um, so I had to I had to get off of those, which I have, and um, so I I know what it's like uh, to to be you know brought into this world of addiction, and my pills were given to me by a doctor, and so you know I had to sit um, as part of getting me off the the pain meds. Uh, the insurance company sent me to this you know, it was an outpatient treatment area and three days a week for two hours a day I sat at a table with about 15 alcohol and drug addicts and um, the man who was leading those classes was a great guy uh, God put me with him for a reason he was also he had been to Bible college so he had a Christian background, so he, I understood him, he understood me, and uh, but just sitting there with that group of people, God opened my heart up to have compassion on those who, for whatever reason, got into drugs or alcohol, um, or um, and we'll talk about other addictions as we go along. We've had several meetings at our church, and. Um, you know this time of year sickness going around weather is bad and we just found that it's not easy for all us to get together uh, each and every week so what I decided to do is if we're not meeting I still want to do 
uh, a study. Number one, to help those who are in our church. Uh, number two, to help those anywhere around the world who deal with some form of, and I'm going to use the phrase sinful addiction, um, the addictions to drugs, alcohol, or fornication of various types. Uh, these are real things. To say they are sin, that is true. But to just simply say there is sin and you should not do it, um, that's not as easily done as it is said. So with some people it takes time. Now God does deliver some people instantly from various things. I've seen him do that. But with others, God has a plan to remove this out of their life. And it may not be done all at once. And so I prayed about it. I thought about you know bringing the scriptures into the context of those who, who deal with or have dealt with addictions. Whether they have walked away from them in their life and they need that guidance and that strength and that help from God's word to stay away from those things or for those who want out and they do not have the power to do it by themselves they need um, a road map to get out of these situations in life to, to stop this and, and primarily, I'm, I'm reaching out to those who say they are Christians, uh, who say they believe the Word of God, but they found out they are powerless against what this flesh body craves. And so, uh, several of the things that we have got together and talked about, I'm going to probably go back to those uh, at some point and go back over those again in this study. Um, but tonight I want to bring in scriptures that um, sort of help us with understanding that this is probably not, you're, you're probably not going to come out of these without help from someone. Now, nobody likes to admit that they've sinned. Nobody likes to admit that they have or are now doing something wrong. And fortunately for us, as you know, given instructions by the Word of God, there is a way that uh, the Bible says confessing you know, your faults one to another. It didn't say confessing your sins. Um, fortunately, we're not told to go to a man, a priest, in a backwards collar to tell him everything we've done because that doesn't work anyway. But we are required to go to God, and it never hurts anybody to have someone in their life that is there to help them. Even in AA, you have someone who is a sponsor. That way, if you feel like drinking again, you call them and say, hey, I need, to, need you to talk me out of going to buy a bottle of alcohol or whatever. And so that's what I want to uh, speak on uh, t in tonight's study is the value of having help someone there, whether it's your husband, wife, a friend, a pastor, um, somebody else who also has been addicted to various things so they understand what it is you're going through and... Um, the importance of keeping people close to you rather than pushing the, these people away. When we push them away, yeah, we want to drink, we want to do drugs, we want to, um, and I'm going to bring in uh, sexual related addictions to this, what the Bible calls fornication, whether you are actively out committing adultery with other people or you are by yourself but you have an internet connection or you've bought magazines or whatever all of these applies you see the Bible even tells us that mystery Babylon who is the spirit let's say the spirit of sin is who she is she has a cup in her hand 
full of the wine of fornication. And fornication is like a wine. People can get addicted to fornication just like people get addicted to alcohol. They like the feeling that comes with it. Um, they It's an addiction. They get addicted to it. You know, uh, Jeffrey Epstein's been in the news, and this is this is a perfect example of that. This guy, when you when you study this guy's life, he had young girls brought to him, young teenage girls, underage girls brought to him, sometimes three or four times a day, every day. He had the money, he had the means, he had the power to do these things. He had his girlfriend, Jelaine Maxwell. She was recruiting these young girls for him every day. Okay? And this guy was insane. He was addicted to this. And he probably didn't want to stop. Didn't want to didn't want to break what he was doing. Alright? So anyway, that can be an addiction just like anything else. And again, to say it's a sin, yes, absolutely it is a sin. But to just say that's a sin, you shouldn't do it with some people that doesn't that's not the answer that doesn't work there has to be God's help in that person's life and I believe God's help will always come through God's Word so tonight let's just let's focus on the help that other people uh, that God will use other people in our lives to bring us help the scripture that I have up on the screen Galatians chapter 6 verse 1 um, he says brethren if a man be overtaken in a fault well that could apply to practically anybody because there is none righteous no not one I don't care how good the church is people are sinners who go to church okay it's as plain as that and in our church I absolutely demand that people be honest with who they are and what they are for none of us to rise up above anybody else and say I'm better than these people are they we shouldn't have those kind of people come to our church are you kidding me these are the people that need to come to our church they are sinners and they want help with their sin I've had people leave our church because they found out other people in the church were sinners we're a hospital we're there to help sick people and sin is the disease. So, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. And so the value of having the brethren, the brotherhood, friends in a church setting or in a family who know that you struggle, with various things you don't want to be this way and they understand that and so I'm here as pastor to help the people in my church who struggle and they have told me pastor you know I did this pastor I did that and it was a mistake I don't want to go back to this I need help I'm not gonna throw them out of the church they came to me looking for help and it's wrong to not help them and so our role as believers in Jesus Christ if someone comes to us first of all for them just to overcome this brick wall here of admitting that they've committed one of these sins that's a big deal for someone to face what it is that they struggle with and to be honest enough to reach out to someone to say yeah I did this and I need help I don't want to be this way anymore that's on their part kudos to them because everybody who has ever had a struggle with any kind of these addictions know the hardest part in the world is to face reality and say I need help so, if a man be overtaken in a fault, which could be anybody, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Because the next time, it could be you that the devil works on in one area of weakness in your life, the thorn that's in your flesh, 
And if you shunned everybody, when you go looking for help, how do you want them to treat you? This gets down to the two laws that we're under as Christians. Love the Lord our God with all our heart and love our neighbor as ourself. Do unto others as we would have them do unto you. So if I realize that I could be overtaken in a fault and I would want to reach out to somebody and say, hey, I need help, then I must be also willing to help those who come to me. So, considering thyself, lest thou also be like, an, lest thou also be tempted. Then he says in verse two, bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. That's the law that I was just talking about. The law that says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Love your neighbor as yourself. And so to help bear the burden of someone in your church or someone in your family that is an alcoholic or someone in your family that has an issue with drugs or someone in your family that has an issue with fornication or any anything else for that matter, to be one of those people that reaches out to help them and to help bear their burden. Wives, you can have an, an excellent ministry in helping your husband overcome the temptations. I know it hurts when you find out that your husband's been lusting after some other woman or you find out that your husband has been drinking or you find out your husband's been doing drugs or whatever. I know that there's pain associated with that. But none of us none of us are perfect. And what we have found, Lisa and I have found in our marriage, is that where I'm weak, she's strong, and where she's weak, I'm strong. And in her weakness, I'm not to say, would you knock it off? I'm so sick of that. I can't do that to her. I shouldn't do that to her. And she doesn't do that to me either. She's there to help me, and I'm there to help her. When we start pushing people away that we think we ha that have problems, like, well, that's your problem. You shouldn't have got involved in that stuff to begin with. That's not the right attitude. The right attitude is, yes, I'll help you. Yes, I'll long suffer with you. How long? How often does God long suffer with us? How off, How much does God forbear us and put up with us? You know, I've heard some people say, you know, God will forgive you the first time. But I don't know, you keep repeating sins and I just don't think you're right with God. You're not saved. I don't believe that. I think God understands that our flesh is weak and not everybody's weakness is the same. And God is willing, I mean, God spent thousands of years forbearing with Israel, long suffering with them, willing to forgive them. How often shall we forgive our brother until seven times? Jesus said, how about 70 times seven? And so God is a loving God. God is a forbearing God. He's a patient God. He understands that people are going to make mistakes. I understand that people are going to make mistakes. And I don't want to be the preacher that everybody's afraid to come tell me that they did something wrong because I'm going to lay into them for that. I don't want to be that kind of preacher. I want to be the kind of preacher that says, you know what, I understand. I really do. Okay? Bear you one another burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think of himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Now, what's interesting about Galatians 6 is that it says two opposite things. Number one, bear ye one another's burdens. Number two, every man shall bear his own burden. So what does that mean? Well, number one, ultimately, I am responsible for me. I'm responsible that if I'm hooked on pain pills, then I can't blame everybody else in the world for that. I took them. And I need to accept the responsibility for it. And I'm responsible for my salvation, my condition with God. I am, when I get to heaven, I won't be able to point to everybody else and say, God, you can't send me to hell because it's all their fault. It's my responsibility. 
but the other part of that is we should be always willing number one to help others number two to reach out and ask people to help us with our problems sometimes it's emotional sometimes it's an addiction or whatever it is but it's sin and the reason why God brings us into the family of God is that in that family we're supposed to find help and encouragement through the problems that we have in life I'm glad that I don't have to go through what I go through every day alone I have a wife that loves me I have my daughters who love me and are there for me I have the best church a guy could ever have those people love me those people care about me and they're there for me and likewise I always want to be there for them uh, verse 6 let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things so that's part of this process as well I'm going to teach you what I've learned, number one, from the experience that I've had. Number two, I'm going to teach you through the Word of God that God taught me skills and ways on how not to go back to the life that I used to live, not to go back to the sins, not to go back to the addictions. So I'm going to help communicate Number one, the experience. Number two, the scriptures that God used to bring me through. Verse seven, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Now, when it comes to our addictions, something very important to remember. While you may be brought out of, let's say, alcohol, and God forgive you and everybody else forgive you the alcohol damages your life it damages your body it damages your brain and those scars are going to be there the rest of your life methamphetamine marijuana cocaine heroin pain pills pornography whatever it is those things bring pain they bring scars the devil promised us a the the good life if we'll drink and drink it up and take the drugs and chase whatever it is he promises those things but they never turned out the way we thought they would turn out he lied to us so yes we went out and sowed sin and even though there is forgiveness understand that there's always a reaping of the things we sowed you may not be able to live the life that at one time you thought you could live simply because of the things that you've done I recognize at my age that mistakes I made years ago are still carried over with me to this very day and it'll always be that way until the day I die. So don't let the devil use that against you to say, see, you should have stayed in drugs or you should have stayed in alcohol. Because, I mean, you know, God promised that everything would be sunshine and roses. And look here, it's not. So you might as well just go back to the old life. Don't use that. And don't let the devil say that to you as a means to get you back into those addictions. Uh, verse 8 for he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption but he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting so let's put this in the context of what we're talking about tonight and that is the importance of family the importance of church the importance of having good relationships if you don't want to do drugs then stay away from the people that are doing drugs if you don't want to drink stay out of bars okay and likewise if you sow into your life 
good people, then you will reap the benefits of having good people in your life. But if you sow into your life bad people, people who are still drinking, people who are still abusing, people who are still doing this and doing that, if you sow that into your life, you're, you're never, you are never going to be sober. You're never going to be sober. Okay? A lot of this stuff is very simple. So verse 9, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Every now and then we get tired of trying, don't we? Man, I, I tried to not think about alcohol. But it just seems like I just think about alcohol. I tried not lusting after another woman or another man or whatever. But I, I, I still do it. Don't give up. Don't let the feelings, the temporary feelings of one day, destroy the sobriety and the sober life that you've built for yourself. Don't let that happen. Verse 10, As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. And so again, as God helps you in your life of sobriety, at some point, then God is going to use you to be a blessing to somebody else who's trying to live sober. And again, people in AA know this, or any other kind of program where people are coming out of addictions. You may not be qualified on your first day of being sober to be the help for everybody else. You're the one who needs help right now. But as time goes on and you learn new skills, you learn new ways of doing things, you, you learn new ways of dealing with things and dealing with things that made you drink or dealing with things that made you use or whatever it is, then you can become the blessing to other people. Let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Now let's go to Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, and it's in Hebrews chapter 10, this verse that we use to encourage people to come to church, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. But let's go back and sort of get the context of that in relation to our sobriety. Hebrews 10, 16, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. And I've said this from the moment we first started doing uh, these addiction studies. You can join AA. You can join um, Narcotics Anonymous or whatever. You can join any of these groups. What good does it do for you to be sober for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, but not have your sins forgiven with God? What good does it do? And, and, and I mean that. You've availed nothing. You may have solved a temporary problem, but there is an everlasting problem that must be dealt with in that and I make no bones about this. These addictions, they are sin. They are a transgression of God's law. And in one of these studies, I'm going to take you through the scriptures and I'm going to show you. God says, don't drink that. Don't put that bottle to your lips. Don't ever, if you never do it, you'll never have to worry about how to stop it. People that smoke, if they'd have never smoked their first cigarette, they wouldn't have to worry about when they're going to smoke their last one. Okay? And so that's the idea, is that what I want more than anything is for the people who hear me talk about things that, I've, that have happened to me and things that have happened to people in our church, I want you to understand that God will forgive you. You can have your sins forgiven by God. And that is the most important thing. Now, if you want to continue in sin, go continue in sin. There's nothing in the world that I can do to stop you. But if you realize that the things you've done were a violation of God's law and God's commandments, 
And you're not going to play games with verses, well, the Bible says do anything in moderation. I've heard people say that. And they were using that as, as an excuse to go out and drink every day. Then if that same, by the way, that same person ends up a meth cooker in the county where he was from. Okay? So he really wasn't looking to just do things in moderation and honor God at the same time. He was looking for an excuse to sin. So the first thing that must happen in your life is you must confess these sins to God and ask God to deliver them from you. And God made a promise. I will. I will forgive your sins. Your sins and your iniquities will I remember no more and I will put my laws in your hearts so that you'll understand that these things are wrong and if you'll let me work my work in you, God says, I will bring you out of these things. I may not do it overnight, but I promise you I will. Now, verse 18. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having an high priest of the house of God, let me sort of characterize what he's saying here. Okay? In the Old Testament, no one was allowed to go into the most holy place in the tabernacle where the Ark of the Covenant was. One man was allowed to go in there one time a year, and that was on the Day of the Atonement, and that was the high priest. And God was very clear on this. If it was violated, whoever went into the most holy place that was not authorized to be in there, they were killed instantly. God, I mean, God was pretty serious about this. It represents his holiness in heaven and God will not be defiled by your sins but now we have Christ Christ who has gone before us to open up the veil that is between us and God Christ then is the mediator between us and God so that when we confess our sins through Christ God forgives all of our sins and God always knows whether or not we're telling we're being honest when we say God I'm sorry some people say God I'm sorry and God knows they're lying through their teeth they're not sorry they want to keep doing it but then there's those those very precious people that say God I'm sorry I don't know how to get myself out of this if I did I would have done it already and God says I'll bring you out don't worry, I'll bring you out. The Israelites didn't know how to go to Canaan land. God led them in there. And God will lead you in his time out of the bondage that you have been in to sobriety and to freedom. So that's what those verses are talking about. So now it's set, and we have a high priest over the house of God, which is Jesus Christ. And remember, Jesus Christ is part of the Godhead that came down here to live our life. Even though he didn't sin, he knows what it's like to be tempted because he spent 40 days in the wilderness not eating anything and then the devil tempts him by saying, see stones, you can turn those to bread, can't you? Aren't you hungry? So Jesus knows what it's like to be weak, to be famished, for his body to have needs. He knows what that's like. And yet, he's without sin. So, you know, I often wondered, you know, God, why did you let me get into taking all those pain pills? But then when I sat in those group sessions three days a week with drug addicts, some of which succeeded, some of which failed. I mean, I can remember a young lady that uh, they, she was trying to get off heroin she was there for about three sessions and then gone. And then somebody mentioned, yeah, she went out and started using again. And I just shook my head. Some people, they're either not ever going to be willing to get help or maybe it, they haven't been burnt enough by sin to want help. But God had me there so that I could learn compassion on people who had weaknesses 
you know, the thing that got me into the pain pills was the pain that I experienced. Once I had the back surgery, that helped a lot with that. But I would say pain is my trigger. Pain is what makes me want to take pain pills. I found out that there are other types of pain that makes people do the things they do. Emotional pain. People that have been abused horribly by other people. And the only way they knew to deal with it was to either get drunk or get high. S different kind of pain, but it's pain nonetheless. And that's what got them there. And so God had me in that place to teach me compassion upon people who have to live in this world and deal with the things that they've had to deal with and to love them and not look down my nose at them but to say you know what I'll pray for you and if I'm ever able to help you I'll be willing to help you okay so that's that's the setup for what we've read so far we have a high priest over the house of God verse 22 let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water two things here Number one, they say confession is good for the soul. Absolutely. Because when we use, or we get high, or we do things we shouldn't do, the guilt sets in. I did it again. And you're always looking over your shoulder. Am I going to get caught? And there's nobody chasing you except for your own conscience. Your conscience knows what you did. You let yourself down. And you let everybody else down, only they probably don't know it yet. There's nothing in the world like having someone you can go to to say to them, I messed up this week. And if they know what you've been through, they'll say, well, I mean, there's no undoing it. You did it. But let me pray with you. Let me give you some encouragement. Uh, let's go back and study the scriptures again so that maybe the next time this temptation comes around you won't do it again like you did this last time okay having your conscience sprinkled in other words your conscience has been cleared your body washed with pure water the pure water in the Bible is always a reference to the Bible okay the Bible says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for correction, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness. So, it's easy to learn how to live wrong. It's easy to find somebody who can sell you drugs. And in today's world, it's easy to find someone to lust after. Easy. Okay? The Bible then is the instructions, gives us the tools that we need so that we learn how not to do those things. We already know how to do them. Now we need the instruction from the pure water of life, the Word of God, on how not to do those things ever again. And then it says, uh, verse 23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering for he is faithful that promised. So, you're a Christian, you're born again, you're coming out of your addictions, but you slip up. Are you not saved anymore? No. You're still saved. God will treat you like a son. He'll either chastise you, or he'll scold you, and he'll say, we're not going to do this again. And if you do it again, I'm going to whip you. I'm going to take a rod after you I, to correct you, to teach you. Pain is a great motivator. So is hunger. And God, as a loving father, will treat us like we do our children. When our children do something wrong, they have to be disciplined in some way. And that's how God will deal with us. So we hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. And then verse 24, let us consider one another 
to provoke unto love and to good works. Again, this is about the value of keeping family, fellow Christians, your church, your Bible. Your Bible's your best friend. It's about keeping these things close to your life instead of pushing them away. When you push them away, it's probably because you want to go out and use again. When you bring them in close, it's because you're saying to them, and after a while, people may learn to recognize this in you. You're pulling them in close and you're saying, without so much saying it, but you're saying, stay close to me because I'm very vulnerable right now and I don't want to go back to the old ways. Okay? So we um, hold, we let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. And then verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. All of these people who say, I can be just a good Christian and not ever go to church. I don't believe that. I do not believe that. Because God has designed us to be social people. Okay? You, you ask anybody who's ever been in solitary confinement, like in a prison, and they'll tell you, it'll drive you nuts. It'll drive you insane. God designed us to be, at least have somebody for us to fellowship with and talk to. Whether it's Christ, who is closer than a brother, the Holy Spirit, or our family, or our church friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, or whatever. Even if, you, even if it's just you reaching out to them through the internet, that's better than nothing. Okay? So we don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as we see the day approaching. So he says, don't reduce the amount of interaction that you have with people that you need in your life. You increase the amount of time and interaction that you have with people in your life. Because they're there to help you and you're there to help them. While it may be their day to need you, the next time it'll be your day, you'll be needing them. Uh, for if we send... Um, and then he says, verse, for, verse 26, For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. And I, I'm, I'm telling you, I've been in church all my life. I've been a pastor for most of my life. And I know the signs. When someone starts removing themselves from church attendance, Probably, sin has already set in. And the sins in their life are telling them, don't go to church. Because if you go to church, you'll feel bad for what you're doing. And then you'll want to stop what you're doing. And the devil doesn't want you to stop. He wants to destroy you. So, I mean, I've just learned this over the years. That when I see people slacking off church, or slacking off, uh, you know, reading their Bible or whatever... They're not doing it in anticipation that sin's coming back. Sin's already back. Okay? And they're just doing what is natural to do when people start enjoying sin again is they start pushing the very people who can help them out of that. They start pushing those people away. And then Psalm 26, verse 8. This is David. And David, David had a sin problem of his own. Remember his? He um, committed adultery with a man's wife. And the story is that David was up on his rooftop and looking down and he could see a woman bathing, you know, in a river or some someplace nearby. I've always had it in my mind that David knew that he could go up to that spot at certain times of day and watch women take their clothes off. That's just what I pictured in my mind. I don't think David was just up there going oh. Okay? So David had his own little sin problem. And here's what David said in Psalm 26. Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house and the place where thine honor dwelleth. Think about it. 
when you're puking your guts up because you drank too much alcohol, is there any honor in that? When you're so high that you've been up for four days tweaking, there's no honor in that. When you're so stoned out of your mind that you can't even stay awake and everybody's just watching you nod off all the time. Yeah, people notice that. There's no honor in that. When you get caught in the arms of some other woman or some other man or looking at something on the internet, there's no honor in that. There is, however, honor where God dwelleth. David said, I have loved the habitation of thy house and the place where thine honor dwelleth. You get tired of the shame of your sin. And you know that it's best that you get in with your friend, the Word of God, that you get in with your friends who love you and who know a little bit about you to know you know that some things trigger the things that happen in your life get around some honorable people verse 9 gather not my soul with sinners nor my life with bloody men in whose hands is mischief and their right hand is full of bribes in other words God take me away separate me out from the people that I did drugs with or that I drank with or the people that I know if I get around them we're gonna go chasing women or we're gonna do this we're gonna God get me away from those people I'm tired of being ashamed of the things I've done in my life I'd like to have a little bit of decency in my life verse 11 but as for me I will walk in mine integrity redeem me and be merciful unto me my foot standeth in an even place in the congregations will I bless the Lord the congregations where God's people are gathering together and I know a lot who follow our ministry they can't find a local church to go to I understand that which is why we stream which is why we have a group on Facebook it's a private group you have to apply to get in we've got to know you're not somebody there that's out trying to steal sheep or whatever but these people gather together and they do it very faithfully. They're there every time we have a service and they don't miss. Even though they're three, four hundred, a thousand miles away from us. They are gathered together with us and God blesses that and God honors that. Because we're all come together to share in the word and to hear the word of God preached. That's where your honor is. That's where your integrity is. And I'm just saying to you, it's a lot better for you to find the habitation of holiness and draw yourself near to that. Family, friends, brothers and sisters in Christ. Getting the help that you need in life. Because like I said, on some days when you're not feeling all that strong, you're going to need some people surrounding you that are strong so they can help you get through it the goal is sobriety the goal is to not do these things ever again and not let them reign and rule over you like they used to Psalm 106 their enemies also oppressed them and they were brought into subjection under their hands your enemies are meth alcohol porn Marijuana, those are your enemies. Um, many times did he deliver them, but they provoked him with their counsel and were brought low for their iniquity. Nevertheless, verse 44, he regarded their affliction. When he heard their cry, and he remembered for them his covenant, and repented according to the multitude of his mercies. Even if you mess up even if and I know a guy that he had been clean from drugs three years one day boom he said I don't know where that came from I said the devil laid a trap for you Jack 
Okay? He messed up. But he admitted it. And he said, I don't want to do this again. He said, why did God let me do that? God let you do that so that you would realize you have to depend on him every day. You can't do this by yourself. He regarded their affliction. He remembered for them his covenant. Verse 46, he made them also to be pitied of all those that carried them captives. Verse 47, save us, O Lord our God, and gather us from among the heathen to give thanks unto thy holy name and to triumph in thy praise. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting, and let all the people say, Amen. Praise ye the Lord. So again, the, the, the point of the night is we can't do this alone. Nobody can. So, you know, when it comes to like uh, when I finally did have my back surgery, I put my wife in charge of the pain pills. Okay? Honey, you give them out to me as I need them. Okay? And she did that. She doesn't want to see me go through what I went through before. I don't want to go through what I went through before. And if you have a loving husband, a, love, a loving wife, you know, I know it's probably next to impossible in some cases to tell them everything you're going through. But at least say, Honey, I'm having a I'm having a bad day here. Will you pray for me? I've done that. Sweetie Pie, pray for your husband. I, I'm having a having a rough day here. Will you will you pray for me? She always does. I have a church that cares about me. I have a family that cares about me. Pushing them away is not going to help you get better, and it's not going to help you stay sober. Drawing these people closer to your life. Making yourself accountable to them. Helps. But you got to be sure you find the right people. Because some people, they're just going to use you and turn on you anyway. Then they're going to go blab everything that you did. you got to be careful with some people. But I don't want that to dissuade you from finding people in your life that will aid you and that will help you get sober, stay sober. We need them. And at some point, as things get better for you, you're going to in turn do the same thing for them. I know it. I know that's how it works. And I hope that it works for you. All right? So let's close with a word of prayer. Let's ask God to help us stay sober, to stay right. Do it for his kingdom's sake. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things shall be added unto you. All right? Father, we ask for your grace, your blessing, your forgiveness, your mercy. We thank you for the mercy you've already given us in, in our lives. And I pray, dear God, that you would bring healing to all the people, Lord, who have struggled with sinful addictions. Father, all of us are sinners. But some people just find themselves in bondage that they cannot deliver themselves from. And Father, help them to understand that though you are a just God that must deal with sin, you have also provided the way through Jesus Christ so that he could take the punishment of our sins and then lead us into a place where we don't do these things anymore. The Father, I pray, dear God, that with everything that has happened in our life, you would use that to keep us humble, to keep us on our knees, and to keep family and brothers and sisters close to us. And Father, one day, when you've blessed us and brought us out of the land of bondage, God, we in turn can seek out others who are looking to be brought out of bondage because we know what it's like. We ask you to bless your word tonight in Jesus' name and amen. It's been a joy to talk to you tonight. 
I hope that the things I said are a blessing to you, and we'll see you the next time. Bye-bye.